In breeder reactor development, proof of breeding and the first generation of electricity using nuclear power was achieved with EBR-1 in the 1950s. In the 60s, EBR-2 was built, incorporating a closed fuel cycle. The reprocessing and refabrication of highly radioactive fuel were all handled remotely. During four years of operation, more than five complete reactor cores were fabricated. This experience clearly established that a remotely operated reactor fuel cycle can be successfully engineered and operated. The further extension of this concept was not possible with the technology of that time. It is now. Technological advances in the past few years make all the pieces fit together to make a complete breeder system. The Integral Fast Reactor, IFR. Advances that make IFR possible are a greatly improved metal fuel burn-up capability, up by a factor of five or more, plus improvements in metal fuel reprocessing that allows complete recovery and recycle of the fuel and allows the removal of important fission products untouched in the earlier process. Low burn-up limits of 2% have been resolved by understanding the swelling phenomenon of metal fuels. As the fuel is utilized, fission gases are trapped in the fuel. This causes it to swell, putting a high stress on the cladding. Increasing the length of the fuel element's cladding jacket enlarges the upper gas space. And by reducing the fuel pin diameter, additional clearance is provided inside the fuel element. The fuel concentration in the pin is increased to compensate for the smaller diameter. Now, by the time the swelling has reached the wall, the fuel is so spongy that further outward swelling is easily restrained by the cladding. High burn-up relies on adequate clearance. With metal fuels, the densities are high enough that the clearance can be provided and its nuclear performance surpasses that of ceramic fuel. Thousands of fuel elements irradiated in EBR2 have been routinely discharged at 8.5% burn-up. Many have exceeded 10%, and a few have attained 18.5% burn-up. New Mark IIA elements are expected to reach an average of 14%. To achieve a high fuel melting point, alternative fuel alloys have been irradiated in EBR2. The most promising is a uranium-plutonium-zirconium alloy. Along with improvements in reactor fuel performance is the utilization of a two-step pyrochemical reprocessing operation. Process steps that could fit into the system that was used at EBR2. Spent subassemblies were removed from the reactor, then transferred to the fuel cycle facility. During transport, adhering sodium was removed by the addition of moist air, changing sodium to sodium oxide, then sodium hydroxide, and finally washing it off. The subassemblies were disassembled mechanically to remove the stainless steel shroud, end pieces, and other hardware. Blanket fuel was declad, and core fuel chopped into convenient sized pieces. The first step in the pyrochemical process is halide slagging. A salt is added to a crucible containing chopped core or blanket fuel, then heated to 1300 degrees centigrade. The chemical reaction between the molten fuel alloy and fused halide salt is such that many fission products from the fuel alloy are transferred to the salt bath. When the process is complete, the salt containing the fission products becomes a waste stream. And the fuel alloy, 
is transferred to the second major process step, electro-refining. In this fuel purification step, a molten salt is used as the electrolyte. The crucible is the anode, and a rod immersed in the molten salt is the cathode. Deposits of uranium or uranium-plutonium from the core or blanket feed collect on the cathode. Again, the residue remaining is a waste stream. The purified product of electro-refining is cast into ingots of metal. The composition of the core fuel ingot is tested and adjusted to the desired level using plutonium and uranium obtained from the blanket. The ingots are passed to the fuel pin fabrication operations. While this product is acceptable for reactor use, it is still highly radioactive and intolerable to human beings, one very effective protection against diversion. The fabrication of metallic fuel proposed for the IFR is essentially identical to those steps developed and used at the EBR2 fuel cycle facility. Fuel pins can be fabricated by injection casting, a hundred or so pins cast at a time. length, then slipped into the clad with a small amount of sodium. Heating and vibrating gives a continuous layer of sodium between the pin and cladding. This provides a thermal bond between the fuel pin and cladding. Then, the sub-assemblies are assembled remotely for return to the reactor. While solving the burn-up problems that blocked earlier development of metal fuels and providing advances in reprocessing are among key factors in the IFR concept, there are several other characteristics to be considered. One feature of inherent safety is the large liquid sodium pool the reactor is immersed in. It provides an enormous heat sink, which makes the primary reactor system invulnerable to possible failure in the rest of the plant. On April 3, 1986, two historic nuclear safety tests of worldwide impact were conducted on Argonne's EBR-2. The purpose was to demonstrate that this kind of reactor is inherently safe and incapable of a nuclear meltdown. Now, what we're about to prove with, by looking at these two generic categories of accidents, if we pick out the worst case transient in either of those categories and conduct it on EBR2 and show that with no operator action or no automatic action, the plant simply shuts itself down by itself, passively, that we're inherently safe. That's our objective. T minus two minutes. The testing about to unfold is the culmination of over 40 years' work toward the development of efficient and safe breeder reactors. T minus one minute. Two groups of potential meltdown situations were simulated. The first, loss of flow, producing a station blackout. Station blackout is a term that's used by NRC, the safety folks, to describe the situation where one loses all bulk AC power. You assume that you lose off-site power. You assume that you're getting no AC power from your own turbo generator. You assume that your first diesel started up and it failed to start up. The second one started to start up and it did also fail. So you end up dead in the water with no AC power. In the second test, loss of heat sink, all means of transferring the heat out of the reactor's primary system were deliberately stopped. 
The plan in both accident tests was not to intervene in any way and see what happens. We will now start to set up for the test. Jerry, if you will put the GN to bypass the subassembly and uh, low flow trip to the reactor. G, to place the primary pump controllers into the cascade mode. And place the data acquisition system into the test mode. The predicted performance for the total loss of flow case shows an increase in coolant outlet temperature well below the boiling point of sodium, followed by a decrease to quite low levels as the negative reactivity inherent in the system takes over. And that is precisely what happened in the actual test. The temperature rose to about 1,200 degrees. 500 degrees below the danger point, and the reactor automatically self-corrected without any intervention either by people or mechanical safety systems. The nuclear reaction slowed, and the temperature dropped back down to a safe operating level. In both severe accident tests, EBR2 shut itself down automatically long before the danger of a nuclear meltdown proving that metallic fuel reactors are inherently safe. The most serious possible thing the operator could do, could cause, we in fact did on EBR2 on April 3rd. And, and uh, the result was absolutely harmless. No accident at all in either case. While EBR2 is a small reactor, it is nevertheless prototypic and in general the inherent safety response is typical of a very large liquid metal reactor using metal fuel. Argonne National Laboratory has proven the first step in the commercial feasibility of liquid metal breeder reactors using metal fuel. They are inherently safe. And Argonne has already developed a commercial scale design for IFR facilities.